Well, good morning or good evening or, or whatever it is. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Mandic. Welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy and a very spooky lecture. Uh, it will have ghosts and spirits in it. It is Substance Dualism and Mental Causation. This is the first lecture in our unit about the mind-body problem. And let's start by doing an overview of the mind-body unit. What is the mind-body problem? You may have um, thought about your mind and, and your body before and uh, certain problems that can occur between the two. You may have heard of things like uh, psychosomatic illnesses. So something that is wrong with your body is a result of something that's wrong with your mind. And often students tell me that's what the mind-body problem is. And I tell them they're wrong. That's not what the mind-body problem is. That's some other problem. But we're talking about a philosophical problem of understanding what the metaphysical relationship is between the mind and physical bodies. Physical bodies includes rocks and trees, and it includes your body. What is the relationship between the mind, like your mind, and physical bodies? And there are two main options that get discussed in the philosophical literature. One option is that the relationship between your mind and physical bodies is that your mind is just one of the physical bodies. Specifically, your mind is your brain. Your mind is a physical body. Your brain is a part of a larger physical body, which is your whole body, which is a part of yet a larger physical system, which is the environment, the ecosystem, the planet Earth. And everything in the universe is physical, including your mind. That's one option to the mind-body problem. That's one option of a solution. Another one of the main options that we're going to discuss is something known as dualism that says that the mind is not any physical body. So things get a little bit more complicated, as you might imagine. What I've just described right now is substance dualism, which we're going to be talking about in this lecture, lecture 23. This is a slightly different way of thinking about dualism, which we'll call property dualism, where instead of thinking about the mind and physical bodies as potentially separate things, maybe the mind is just uh, a certain kind of um, or collection of properties that the thing in question is a whole person, and that person has different properties. Some of them are physical properties, like their height and their weight, and other properties are irreducibly mental properties. Their thoughts and their experiences in particular introduce properties that can't be understood as reducing to the kinds of properties that you would study in the physical sciences. And we're going to talk about a certain kind of mental property called qualia. We're going to have a lot of fun with qualia. And then finally, we're going to come at a slightly different angle on the mind-body problem, and that is the philosophical problem of artificial intelligence. There are a lot of problems involving artificial intelligence, like uh, could you build an artificial intelligence, and if so, how? What's going to happen when artificial intelligences take over all of our jobs? Those are, those are some of the problems that artificial intelligence introduces. But one of the problems is a metaphysical problem about whether there could even be artificial intelligence. Is everything that is artificial necessarily unintelligent? Or could there instead be something that is fully intelligent, even though it's just a machine? Now, this should remind you of the mind-body problem, because physical things are mechanical. They obey the laws of mechanics as set forth in physics. And so maybe we already are machines. Maybe we already are robots. Maybe we already are computers. And building one artificially is... It's not a philosophical problem. Maybe it's an engineering problem, but it's not a philosophical problem. But there are interesting special arguments about the mind-body problem that come by thinking about artificial intelligence. And we'll get to those when we get to lecture 25. But let's spend uh, some more time talking about what's at stake between substance dualists. So, one very simple, or maybe even simplistic way of putting this is we've got a debate between physicalists and dualists. Physicalists say everything is physical, including the mind. 
The mind is a physical thing or a physical process. Just like digestion is a physical process and growth is a physical process, so is thinking. Thinking is something that the brain does, and the brain is just physical. The brain is made out of cells. The cells are made out of chemicals that are made out of atoms. It all just obeys the laws of physics. You're one big biological machine. You're purely physical. That's physicalism. And historical representatives of the physicalistic position would include Aristotle and Nietzsche. Dualists would include Plato and Descartes, and they would say that there's something very different between the mind and physical reality. That your mind is able to do things that can't be explained in terms of the laws that apply to physical things, that apply to biological things. The mind cannot be reduced to anything physical. The mind might be an entirely separate thing, like like a ghost or a spirit that can leave your body. I mentioned that Aristotle was a physicalist, and one, one way of viewing his physicalistic theory of the mind is something that we brought up, actually, back in our, un our lecture about virtue ethics. We we're talking about function and what Aristotle thought the relationship was between having a function and performing a function and the human soul, and he illustrated the point by saying, if the eye were an animal, then sight would be its soul. So if you think about the relationship between sight and an eye, you realize that sight is not a thing separate from the eye. The eye is a thing, and sight is something that it does. Sight is a function it performs, but sight is not some like extra thing. That would be one example of physicalism, to deny that the mind is some separate thing from physical bodies. You might say that the mind is something that the brain does. The dualist, in contrast, is committed to some degree of literal literalness to holding that the mind is a separate thing. Now, one very literal way of putting it is to say that the mind is a soul or a spirit. It's the ghost in the machine. Maybe it's the sort of thing that can become detached from the body at death. There's certain views of reincarnation or, or life after death that make this kind of dualism a very vivid uh, possibility. Um, so that would be substance dualism illustrated here. We've got two things. There's the ghost and there's the, the, the physical body. or the, There's the astral body and the physical body. That would be a very literal interpretation of substance dualism where you've got the, the soul is separate from the body. But on the Aristotelian model, the soul is not a separate thing. It's just more like what the, what the body does. It's the, the body performing its function. Okay, let's spend some time doing something that a lot of, uh, frankly, a lot of students have difficulty with, but um, I'm sure that you guys would be fine. Uh, and that's understanding the distinction between substance dualism and property dualism. And that distinction is going to come down to understanding the distinction between substances and properties in philosophy. And one of the main things to not get hung up on is the word substance. In philosophy, we mean a very different thing from substance, but we mean a very different thing by substance than you might mean ordinarily. In philosophy, the word substance just means thing, or really you might understand substance in contrast with the word property. So you've got an idea of like what properties are. So for example, um, here's a thing, and it has many properties. This has the property of being red. It has the property of being longer than it is wide. It has the property of being made of plastic. It's got many properties. And then there's the thing that has the properties. That's a substance in the philosophical sense of substance. A substance is a property haver, the sort of thing that has properties. So... Um, the difference then between property dualism versus substance dualism is for property dualism, there, there's a proposal that there's certain special properties which are mental properties, which are distinct from physical properties. But with substance dualism, there's a proposal that there are certain kinds of things which are minds. And those things aren't identical to any of the physical things, like brains. We might put it like this. For the substance dualist, there are, when we're talking about mind 
minds and bodies. We're talking about two distinct things. But really, but what we should be thinking about, according to property dualism, is instead there's just people. You want to talk about things in the neck in this neck of the woods? The things are the people, and the people have two different kinds of properties. Some of the properties are mental properties, which aren't physical, and the and other properties are physical and not mental. That's property dualism. The contrast between properties and substances is something that you're supposed to have understood way, way, way back in lecture 11 when we were talking about Descartes' argument about the wax. Descartes was trying to illustrate rationalism. He was trying to say that there's a kind of knowledge that you have that doesn't come through the senses. And it's the knowledge of the continuity of substance despite the change of property that is evident to the senses. Like, for example, when you melt the piece of wax. The wax changes all of its sensible properties, but nonetheless, you know it's still the same thing. How do you know that? Well, you must know that by some rational faculty, which is not reducible to what's given to the senses. Therefore, rationalism wins, empiricism loses. That was Descartes' argument. In order to understand Descartes' argument, you had to understand the difference between properties and substances. So, um, if you understand the difference between properties and things, then you understand the difference between properties and substances. The substance dualist is someone who's going to be arguing that mind and body are two different sorts of thing. And the property dualist is going to be saying that mind and body are just two different categories of properties that can be had by one and the same thing, where the thing in question is a person. Okay. Now we're going to switch to some arguments for substance dualism. And there's lots and lots and lots of arguments for substance dualism. We're going to focus on one kind of argument and several examples of that one kind of argument. The kind of argument we're going to be focusing on, all, uh, all of the examples of this kind of argument are going to involve a logical principle known as Leibniz Law, which we have been exposed to, I think, on several occasions now this semester. When we were talking about whether God can move the whole universe six feet to the left, it came up then. Um, there's a lot of examples in which it came up. When we were talking about the problem of, of survival, like how can I be the same Pete Mandic that once used to be nine years old, even though like I'm way fatter <laughs> than that nine-year-old? Like that involved Leibniz law reminder. Leibniz law states that if X and Y are identical, that means if X and Y are one and the same thing, then whatever property X has, Y has to have, and vice versa. If X and Y have all and only the same properties, then X and Y are really just the same thing. They're literally the same thing. They're literally the same substance. We use Leibniz law for example, when we prove the guilt or innocence of somebody, right, in, in your typical CSI law and order type scenario, right, we know that um, the Pete Manda can't be Jack the Ripper because Jack the Ripper had uh, size 14 shoes, but Pete Manda has only size 11 shoes, so therefore I'm not Jack the Ripper. That would be an application of Leibniz law. So if you're going to prove that the mind and your brain are two different things, then there would have to be some property that your brain has that your mind does not have, or vice versa, right? That just stands to reason. And the central reason that you're using in drawing that conclusion is Leibniz law. You're applying Leibniz law to the question of mind and brain. You're applying Leibniz law to the question, which is the central question of the mind-body problem. What sorts of properties have substance dualists alleged to belong only to minds and not to any physical bodies like brains. Well, we're going to look at uh, three versions of answers to that question. We're going to look at uh, non-spatiality. So some substance dualists have claimed that minds are non-spatial, but all physical bodies are spatial. And this should remind you of some of the stuff that we talked about in lecture 12 about space and infinity in, at, early in our metaphysics unit. We're going to be back to space, talking about space and whether what it means for things to exist 
and whether they can exist in a non-spatial way. Then we're going to talk about something called intentionality, intentionality with a T, and then we're going to be talking about indubitability, the ability, uh, the inability to be doubted. Uh, spoiler alert, indubitability should remind you of cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, and the question of whether you can doubt your own existence. Okay, non-spatiality. So most, uh, most things that you're familiar with are physical things, and those things take up space. They have spatial parts, even if they are physically indestructible, like a perfect diamond that could never be cut in half. It still has parts, like you could, you could have it go halfway into a hole. So there's the part that's in the hole, and there's the part that's sticking out of the hole, even though you couldn't li literally cut it into parts. Everything that takes up space has spatial parts, the top part, the bottom part, the inside, the outside, the left, and the right. But there's an argument that we find in Descartes, and he says, well, if you, the mind doesn't have parts. It doesn't make any sense at all to say that my mind has a top half versus a bottom half, a left half versus a right half. But of course, physical bodies do have parts, like brains, they have parts. So therefore, the mind is not identical to the brain. The brain has spatiality, but the mind is non-spatial. The mind has no parts. And if you really push it, the mind doesn't even have any physical location, which is weird. If the mind is not spatial, then how come your mind is only really aware of what's going on in your body, right? Like if I drop a bowling ball on my foot, you're not going to feel my pain. You might be like, oh, dude, not want to look at it, but you're not going to literally feel my pain. Why is that? The physicalist has a great answer to that question. Uh, your mind is your brain, and my mind is my brain, and my brain is connected to my foot, and your brain is not connected to my foot, and that's why I can feel my pains, and you can't. But if minds are non-spatial, well, one way of like really taking that to the limit is to say that they have no location at all. So your mind is as not located in my body as it is your body. And so, like, why couldn't you feel my pains? Why couldn't you read my thoughts? If, if our minds are both nowhere then how can my mind have a special connection to my body? This problem that I'm spelling out turns out to be like th the big killer problem for substance dualism, and we're going to come back to it. But let's move on to something called intentionality. Intentionality is a philosophical term that you might put in terms of aboutness. Any mental state which is about something, like... If you have a thought, you're thinking about the Eiffel Tower. If you have a desire, that is a desire for beer, so it's about beer. Your mental states are about things. And you might say, that's something that nothing physical can do. Phys physical things can't be about anything. Aboutness is just so weird. Only minds can do it. You may have heard that nothing can travel Nothing can travel a distance without traveling at the speed of light. There's nothing, there's no such thing as an instantaneous, instantaneous action at a distance. But right now, you're thinking about Jupiter, aren't you? Right now? It doesn't take, like, several hours for your thoughts to get from your, your brain to Jupiter. It just happens automatically. Also, you could think about all sorts of things besides Jupiter. You could think about things that don't exist... You can think about things that n never existed. That's so odd and strange. You might think it's non-physical. Now, some people say that intentionality is, is the sort of thing that is entirely physical. And examples of that would include, like, sentences. I could take a piece of chalk and write on a chalkboard, Jupiter is bigger than Saturn. That sentence is physical. It's a bunch of chalk on the board. Doesn't it have aboutness or intentionality? And now a philosopher could argue that what we're really talking about here is original intentionality versus derived intentionality. The chalk on the chalkboard has only derived intentionality. In order to be about Jupiter, it has to be interpreted to be about Jupiter. But other people could have used those symbols to refer to dogs or fish or something like that. There's nothing intrinsic to the chalk on the board that makes it be about Jupiter. You need thinking creatures to interpret it 
to be about Jupiter. But our thoughts themselves don't need to be interpreted. No one can come along and interpret my thoughts and make them be about fish and, and dogs instead of Jupiter. My thoughts have original intentionality. And so this argument, we might state it not just in terms of intentionality, but specifically in terms of original intentionality. And the argument might go something like this. Only mental states can have original intentionality and nothing physical can have original intentionality. So uh, brains can't have original intentionality, but minds can have original intentionality. So therefore, minds are not identical to brains. So we've talked about the non-spatiality version of the Leibniz law argument and the intentionality version of the Leibniz law argument. Let's talk about the indubitability version of the Leibniz law argument. Notice that in each of these arguments, we're saying there is a property that X has that Y lacks where X is your mind and Y is your brain. Okay, indubitability. Now, recall from Descartes, back in lecture one, he was wondering about whether there was some all-powerful deceitful demon that has given him all, his, all of Descartes' ideas and beliefs and whether it would be possible for that demon to make all of the beliefs be false. And Descartes realized that there's at least one belief that would have to be true. And we could put it like this. It's the belief that he has a belief. Another version of this is put not in terms of belief, but in terms of thinking. Can you doubt whether you're thinking? Well, doubting is just a kind of thinking, and so therefore you must be thinking, and so uh, you can't doubt that you're thinking. You can't, you can't think that you're thinking and have that thought be false. So if the demon gives you thoughts, the demon's going to have to give you one guaranteed true thought, and that is the I think thought. If you think that you think, then that thought has to be true. On a correspondence theory of truth, that thought is its own correspondent. It corresponds to itself and it makes itself true. So you might say minds are indubitable. Cogito ergo sum, I know that I exist because I think, and it cannot be doubted that I exist. But can physical things be doubted? Well, how do you know about physical things? You know about them through your senses, says Descartes. But everything that you know through your senses can be doubted. It is not indubitable. It is highly dubious. You can doubt it. So uh, your mind has the property of not being doubtable, but every physical thing, which is known only through the senses, does have the property of being doubtable. So therefore, the mind is not identical to any physical thing. That's, that would be a Leibniz law version that appeals, instead of to the property of non-spatiality or intentionality, it appeals to a property of indubitability. It says your mind has a property, being indubitable, that your brain lacks. They might say that's something funny going on here with these arguments. There's something fishy, especially with the indubitability argument. I don't like it. What's going on here, Mandic? Is there an objection that we can raise? And one objection is to say that all of those Leibniz law arguments, or maybe specifically the argument in terms of indubitability, they commit a certain kind of fallacy known as the intentional fallacy. And by the way, I keep telling you that the terminology in philosophy sucks. And I keep telling you it's not my fault that it sucks. But here's another example of some crappy terminology in philosophy. The word intentional with an S is a very different word from the word intentional with a T. Intentionality with a T is the aboutness of mental states, the directedness of a mind towards its objects. Intentionality with an S is something different. That's something weird. And its opposite is extensionality with an S. And we don't have to get very deep into it, but if you were to take another philosophy class, maybe a, uh, a class on logic or a class in the philosophy of language, you can get deeper into the difference between intention with an X, with an S, and extension with an S, and intention with a T. But what you need to know for understanding this fallacy is something that we might convey in terms of this example. Superman has the property of being known by Lois Lane to be bulletproof. 
Clark Kent lacks that property. Therefore, Superman is not Clark Kent. I hope everyone appreciates that Superman is Clark Kent, even though they're imaginary and stuff. Uh, I think you get the point. Superman is Clark Kent. But Lois Lane does not know that Superman is Clark Kent. Lois Lane knows that Superman is bulletproof. She doesn't know that Clark Kent is bulletproof. Can that be used to prove that Clark Kent is distinct from Superman? No, it cannot. It's obviously a fallacy. Well, what is the fallacy? And the fallacy here is to think of a property of Lois's state of mind as being a real property of the thing it's a state of mind about. And you might say, wait a minute, man, you're now talking about intentionality with a T. I thought this was intentionality with an S. And I apologize, this is confusing. But the main idea we might put in terms like this. Intentionality with an S has to do with sense, where extensionality with an extensionality with an S has to do with reference. And we could have two different words that refer to the same thing. Like for example, the morning star and the evening star, they both refer to the planet Venus. But there's different senses. There's different connotations with the same denotation. Intention with an S is just connotation. So Clark Kent has a different connotation from Superman. That is, the words Clark Kent have a different connotation from the word Superman, even though those two different words and those two different connotations refer to the same entity, namely this, this entity who is both known as Clark Kent to some and Superman to others. So the intentional fallacy is to confuse the properties of a description with the properties of the thing. There's this one description, which is Clark Kent, and there's this other description, which is Superman. Uh, but those aren't properties. Those aren't distinct properties. Knowing that Superman is bulletproof is a distinct state of knowledge, is a, a distinct state of Lois Lane's mind from the question of whether Clark Kent is bulletproof. That shouldn't prove anything about Superman. Superman either is bulletproof or he isn't. And since Superman is Clark Kent, whatever goes for Superman also goes for Clark Kent. You might work backwards then through these arguments and say, well, no. How about indubitability? So Descartes can't doubt the existence of his mind. Well, if the brain is the mind, then he can't doubt the existence of the brain either. And Descartes says, sure I can. I'm, I'm doubting it right now. Like, Descartes, no, you're, you're just like, you're like Lois Lane. There's a description, which is the brain description, but it describes one and the same thing as the mind description. And unbeknownst to you, they are identical. And your crappy argument fails to prove anything else. Okay, I had previously noted that there was something that was like the biggest problem for substance dualism, and that came up when we were talking about non-spatiality. And I was saying that there's just something really deeply, intolerably weird and mysterious by the, about the proposal that our minds have no location whatsoever, no spatial properties whatsoever, yet my mind interacts with my body and not your body. My mind is able to feel the pain in my foot, but not your foot. That is the problem of interaction. And that really is a killer problem, the problem of interaction, against Descartes and his substance dualism. And this classically gets brought up in a conversation between Descartes and Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who had hired him to be his, uh, her philosophy tutor for a while, a while towards the end of his life. But let's talk a little bit about mental causation first. What's mental causation? It's kind of what it sounds like. Mental causation is any time you've got causation involving anything mental. And there's a couple different main varieties. One variety is when something um, mental is caused by something non-mental. So for example, in uh, physical perception, like uh, visual perception. So here's something non-mental. My gavel, that's non-mental. And you see it. And your, your perception of it is mental. 
So in any case of the perception of a physical object, you've got a physical thing causing a mental thing. The mental thing is the perception. Now the idealist would say, oh, <laughs> the hammer is mental also, and let's ignore them for now. If you're not an idealist, then you'll have no problem agreeing that, right, one example of mental causation is when you've got a non-mental thing causing a mental thing. Another example of mental causation is the opposite, and this is the sort of thing that we talked about when we were talking about free will, when a mental thing causes a non-mental thing. So I make a decision in my mind, and, and that's a mental thing. I decide to go look in the refrigerator to see if I can find some beer to go with my pizza. And that results in me standing up and getting off my butt and marching my body upstairs and opening the refrigerator. And those are all physical things, the refrigerator opening. So action is an example of something in the mind causing something in the material world. And then there's also mind-mind causation, something mental causing something else. So like I might, um, I might be in a, a play in, or auditioning for a play and I need to appear angry. And so I, I, um, I decide that I want to make myself angry. So that's a mental thing, deciding that I want to make myself angry. And then I try to think of things that would make me angry. And um, I imagine somebody, a complete stranger, running up to me on the street with a pair of tweezers and pulling a hair right out of my nose. And that just makes me really angry thinking about it. Um, so I had a, a, now I'm in a state of anger. Where did the state of anger came, come from? It came from a state of imagination. Where did the state of imagination come from? It, may, it came from a decision that I made. Those are all examples of mental, mental causation. So we've got physical to mental, mental to physical, and mental to mental. Those are all examples of mental causation. You might wonder how those things are supposed to work if Descartes' substance dualism is true. And that is a problem that Princess Elizabeth put forth to Descartes. She said, look, if all those Leibniz law arguments are true, accurate, sound, for example, the non-spatiality, then it's a complete mystery how there could be mental causation, how could there could be mental to physical or physical to mental causation in particular. It's a total mystery. If the mind is that different from physical bodies, then how could the mind cause anything in the physical world? And how could anything in the physical world cause anything in the mind? When we're dealing with physical, physical causation, like one ball hitting another ball, we understand how that works. We understand like why one solid thing would push another solid thing out of its way. It's in part because they came to the same place. But if the mind is not spatial, the mind isn't located anywhere, then why would the mind be able to cause anything in your body at all? And why would it only be able to cause things in your body? So substance dualism makes causation completely mysterious in a way that physicalism doesn't. Physicalism allows mental causation to be fully understandable, fully explainable. Um, you might see how bad the problem is when you look at some other attempts besides Descartes' attempt to make sense of dualistic interaction between mental and physical things. So one version is Descartes' version. Descartes has an interactionist version whereby there actually is interaction. There's other theories, they just basically explain interaction by denying interaction, they explain it away. One is epiphenomenalism, which is to claim that the mind is like the foam on an ocean wave of the physical body. And the, like the foam doesn't make the waves go up and down. Similarly, the mind doesn't make anything happen. The body makes the mind happen, and the mind is just along for the ride. This is kind of the picture that we got from the Libet experiment in our discussion of determinism back at the beginning of the free will unit. The suggestion that the feeling of free will is merely an illusion, that the readiness potential is what caused the hand to flick. And it also caused you to feel like you had free will, but your feeling of free will didn't make anything happen. So that would be epiphenomenalism. You just deny that there's any causation from the mind to the world. But that would seem to rule out all sorts of things, like, for example, moral responsibility. Uh, that doesn't seem like a very inviting version. Another way of trying to deal with this problem by just denying that there's any interaction at all is something called parallelism. And one way of understanding parallelism is as the proposal that at the beginning of time, God created two realms, the physical realm where your mind lives, and the, sorry, 
the physical realm where your body lives and the mental realm where your mind lives. And he made them synchronized so that it seems like decisions in your mind make your body do certain things. And things impacting the outer surfaces of your body give rise to certain perceptions in your mind. But that's just an illusion. It's really just a series of coincidences that God set up. Well, that seems to mess with free will and moral responsibility also. That means, like, you can't really... You, you're not deciding to kill somebody if you decide to drop kick a baby. Well, really what's happening is God set that all up in the first place to make it seem to you like your decision made your foot kick the baby. Really, God is kicking the baby. That seems messed up. Study questions. Study question one. Substance dualism is A. The view that the universe contains two sorts of things, minds and physical bodies. B. The view that there are two kinds of properties in reality, mental properties and physical properties, neither of which are reducible to the other. C. The idea that you take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Matrix reference. D. The idea that if an event has one cause, then it cannot also have a second cause. E. The view that good cannot exist without evil, and evil cannot exist without good. Study question two. The intentional, with an S, fallacy. See, intentional with an S. The intentional fallacy is A, a confusion between what is done on purpose and what happens accidentally. B, the logical fallacy of affirming the consequent. C, is like having your brain smashed out by a slice of lemon wrapped around a large gold brick. That is another Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference. Uh, by the way, that was a description of uh, the Pan Galactic Gargle Blaster. If none of the students know what I'm talking about at all, that's pretty sad. And you might say, yes, that is pretty sad. Uh, D, a confusion between, on the one hand, properties that something really has with, on the other hand, properties that it has only under some description, or E, the logical principle, that if you can think about something, then that thing must exist. And then finally, study question three, Princess Elizabeth's objection against Cartesian substance dualism is every event is determined by some prior event. A, if the mind... Uh, you know what? As a typo, screw up question there. Okay, sorry. Uh, stick with me. Princesses, mm, Princess Elizabeth's objection against Cartesian substance dualism is, and then I'm going to delete this part. Princess Elizabeth's objection against Cartesian substance dualism is a: if the mind is totally distinct from physical objects, then it would be impossible to have knowledge of the external world. B, why two substances? Why not three, maybe? C, why you stuck up half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder? Uh, that's an Empire Strikes Back reference. D, it is very problematic to hold that something that is non-spatial can have effects on and be affected by something that is spatial. E, if I can conceive of something, it must therefore be possible. All right, what are the answers? The answers are that. One is A, two is D, three is D. And that brings us to the end of lecture 23 about substance dualism and mental causation. And until next time, keep on having a mind. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave on that. No.